All right, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You can find it on U version. The title of today's teaching is Resurrection is Coming. Resurrection is Coming. We've been looking at different chapter 15s throughout Scripture. And probably the two most theological chapters we've looked at, uh, well, we, one of them was Acts 15, and the other is today, 1 Corinthians 15. So uh, these two are the most important theological chapters, in my opinion, in this series. So I hope you learn something today, and I hope you never think of the resurrection the same again, because resurrection has not occurred only Resurrection is also coming. We have something called CIL Forward, which you can access online, where we talk about who we are and where God is taking us, because God's taking our church under his leadership uh, to new places, new places of influence. And I'm so glad that either you're part of this church or you're investigating this church, because this is a special place. And it's a special place because Jesus is in charge here and we honor and we bless him. But Jesus has given us a strategy uh, to reach our community. And one of the things we talk about in CIL Forward is that strategy. We're called to cultivate small groups, equip the next generation, develop leaders, embody mission. So that's what we do uh, to live out his mission. So a few years ago, we worked on a master plan for the property of our church. And it was really great, and it was cool, and it was exciting, and then uh, things have changed, and so we kind of had it in the closet, and we, had, uh, we needed to dust it off and update it, and so we did that. We've been doing that, uh, working with the board recently. Maybe we'll talk about that next year sometimes. Uh, we have 17 acres. How many know it's not God's will for us just to mow 17 acres until he comes again, right? <laughs> We want to use the property for his glory. So a few years ago, uh, I met with different, different stakeholders in the church, uh, board members and um, 242 leaders and those who are involved in children's ministry. And we, we went through like this whole brainstorming um, exercise to say, to say this, like if money was no option, what would we want to build here on this property? And so there were lots of different ideas, but there was really one idea that came from one person that nobody liked at all. And that one person was me. <laughs> and I presented an idea and nobody liked it. And here was the idea. I'll go, it's safe to tell you because it's not going to happen. <laughs> I thought somewhere on this property, we could put a church cemetery. See, everybody groans, right? <laughs> I had my reasons why I thought that might be kind of cool. Got no help, no support. No one was interested. So that's not in our future plan. But I will point out something that here in Sumner County, some of the oldest churches that you'll see in Sumner County, and I think about First Presbyterian on Main Street, there's a cemetery in the, in the front of the church. And... This is more than a enterprise or something convenient. It was a physical statement of our faith. The statement was reminding others that when Christ comes again, the dead will be resurrected. This is what 1 Corinthians chapter 15 makes it very clear. And as modern people, our minds are programmed not to like that doctrine. So, we, because we have this way of thinking that spirit is good, flesh, physical is bad. And so, I, I want us to look at what Paul told the Corinthians church, which was in Greece, which Greek thought is what feeds the way we think. And so, because of that, there's part of us that we don't really value the body like the Jews do. The Jews very much value the physical body. And that's why one of the things that you'll see unfold here in the next weeks and months is how important it is uh, for Jewish people to retrieve the remains of those who were massacred and, and even soldiers and so forth in the future. I say that not as a negative, uh, to, to bring up something negative or hard to hear, 
but to let you know that value from which our faith springs as Christians is still, is still active today and should be part of our consideration. So here's my first point today before we go read the scripture. Resurrection is certain. And I want to tell you something. We will be resurrected. We will be resurrected in the future. And we'll see that from the scripture. First Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to start with verse 12. And this is Paul refuting people in that church in Greece, in Corinth, who said uh, the resurrection isn't really going to happen. There's, the physical resurrection is not important. And so Paul refutes this in verse 12, and he says this. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is vain, and so is your faith. Moreover we, are, moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified wrongly about God that he raised up Christ, whom he didn't, did not raise up if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So resurrection is certain. Everything in Christianity is based off resurrection. The very first preachers who proclaimed Jesus was the Messiah used the fact that Jesus had been resurrected from the dead as proof he wasn't like Isaiah, he wasn't like Jeremiah, he wasn't like a great rabbi or prophet. He was different. Why was Jesus different? Because Jesus had been resurrected. Paul said, you just read that, that if this fact is not true, then faith is not true. If Jesus has not been resurrected, then everything we do is false. So there's a couple of groups I want to talk about. There's a group called the Sadducees. And if you remember, Jesus would always talk to the Pharisees and Sadducees. The Pharisees, even though he talked more to them, were actually more conservative theologically. And the Pharisees actually believed in the physical resurrection of the dead. But the Sadducees did not. The Sadducees were Jewish, and they thought, well, resurrection may be uh, spiritual resurrection, but not physically, physical resurrection. And so we know that they were a smaller group, and then they eventually, they eventually uh, basically disappeared, the Sadducees. Then I've already mentioned to you Greek philosophers. So the church in Corinth, they're being influenced by what, for lack of a better term, I don't like to use the word liberal and conservative because it means so much different things to different people, but for lack of a better term, a theologically liberal Jewish group called the Sadducees. Also, they're being influenced by the predominant thought process by the Greeks that the physical body is bad and that the spirit needs to be liberated from the body. And so within this church, there was this thought, there's no resurrection. There's no resurrection of the dead. And Paul said, wait on, wait a second, hold on. If there's no resurrection, then Jesus wasn't resurrected. And then your faith is useless. So when I think about the resurrection, it's so important. I don't believe in the resurrection just out of obligation. It has to be something that God does in my heart. Because here's the question. If you do not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Can you still be a Christian? According to this passage today, no. That, that's part of being a Christian. When we take communion later on today, we are taking the symbol and, and the bread and the cup and the presence, and we are people of resurrection. We're, we're people that remember the cross and celebrate the cross because there is a resurrection. So, so much is on the line. So, 
Now we're at the most basic level of why we need to be, believe in the resurrection. Well, out of obligation, because I want to be a Christian. Okay, so that's, that's that, right? Uh, there's sometimes in some parts of the world, like Tennessee, there's a benefit of believing in the resurrection because um, we still are in a culture where most people at least give a nod to Christian beliefs. There's this idea of groupthink, that like there's a power when we all think the same thing. And, and, and that might be a reason to believe the resurrection, but it's not the best reason to believe the resurrection. And then there's, there is evidence. I mean, some could say that you could give evidence and maybe a strong, reasonable defense for the resurrection. I remember there was a very popular book in the 70s or 80s uh, that, that I know about evidence that demands a verdict, evidence that there is a resurrection. And there's great uh, uh, there's pre great presentation from reason why there has to be a resurrection. But even people who, who saw the Lord, <laughs> I mean, he could deny the Lord, right? I mean, the, the, the evidence isn't enough too. So my favorite quote, it came from an Aust Austrian philosopher that I can't really tell you much about, but I came across this quote and it's, it's so amazing. It's this, it is love that believes the resurrection. It's not important who said it. I'm just, it's important that I'm saying it now. It is love that believes the resurrection. Okay? And this, this, I think about this every Easter. The love that we receive from the Lord. And we believe in the resurrection because we love the Lord. Because groupthink and evidence even, th those things aren't enough obligation trying to stay out of hell. Those things are the most basic level. But it's the love he gives us that we believe the resurrection is true and the resurrection occurs. Some would say, well, hey, if the resurrection's not true, it's still beneficial. It's still good to believe in Jesus because it makes you more moral and kind and loving. Well, Paul refutes that in the scripture we just read. So some parts of the world, as I mentioned, it is beneficial to believe the resurrection. But many, many Christians who have lived on planet earth have had negative consequences because they believed in the resurrection. They've lost jobs. They've lost homes. They've been cut off from their families. I know that we can easily find benefit in the context that we live, but we must remember that many, many Christians who have lived in this world have not believed who have believed in the resurrection have suffered for that. And that is why verse 19, if we could put that back up, Paul makes this argument. If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. This pushes back against the belief, well, let's believe the resurrection as a mythical story just to make us more moral and kind and to give order to society. Well, Paul's writing to people who in the future would have maybe lost loved ones, lost careers, lost family inherited property. And he's saying, hey, if it's only for this life that you've lost all that stuff, you're to be pitied. This is consequential. The resurrection, believing in that cost us something. And that's why we believe the resurrection out of love. Here's my second point today. Resurrection is coming. That's actually the title of this message, but it springs from this point. Now let's go to verse 20. Verse 20 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead. Now here's an important word. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What does fall asleep mean? Those who have died. Think about this. Christ has been risen from the dead. Look at that word. For the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 21. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. So Paul uses an analogy between Christ's resurrection and the first fruits offering in the Old Testament. So if you have time later, you can go to Leviticus 23, and it's one of many places, several places that talks about the first fruits offering. 
So we know we believe in giving to the Lord and tithing to the Lord, but it's not also what we give, it's when we give it. We prioritize it. So a first fruits offering is the first fruit of your crop, the first part of your harvest. You give to God first, because when you give to God first, then everything else is is a symbol that everything else is holy and everything belongs to him. So we don't give God our leftovers, we give God our first fruits. Now this is now used as a metaphor. This is some of you are like, oh, I hadn't thought about that before. The people who read this, the believers in Corinth, they knew this already. So Paul is saying this, Jesus, his resurrection was the first fruits of resurrections that will come. So the resurrection, though it was, it, it happened and it occurred for him, it was the first before it happens to the rest of us. Paul sees a resurrection, not just a one-time event. He reinforces the fact that it was a first fruits transformational event. It was the beginning of a new era. It was the beginning of a new promise. It was something that changed everything. That's why it's good for us to celebrate Easter and to, and, and, and to do that in the spring that's a good and beneficial. But the reason we have worship on Sunday and not on Saturday, which was the original Sabbath, we have worship on Sunday because the first church worshiped on the Lord's day, the day that he was resurrected. So when you come to church on Sunday, you're proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus. Like we're in resurrection power uh, every day of the year and particularly every Every Sunday, Sunday's the first day of the week. A lot of, a lot of you, it's the first thing you do on Sundays. you come to church. I mean, it's a first fruits for your week. It's like you're putting God first by coming to church, and it's going to make the rest of the week even better because it's the first fruits of your time. It's the first fruits of your love. It's the first fruits of your relationship. This is a powerful thing. This is, again, a metaphor that the resurrection are the first fruits of all who know Christ who will be resurrected. There is a first fruits, but there's a full harvest coming of those who have, those who have died or fallen asleep, as this translation says, in the Lord. It's not the end for them. It's not over for them. They're not just a memory. They are part of a cloud of witnesses, and they and we will be resurrected at the coming of the Lord. This is so important. He goes on to talks about Adam, and he talks about Jesus. And it's, it's amazing how a decision of one person can be so consequential. And I want to remind you of something, again, that's going to be hard to hear, but it needs to be spoken on a regular basis. In 1941, uh, a, a man made a decision. This decision had been culminating for uh, well over 10 years. But Adolf Hitler made a decision called the final solution. And the final solution was what we now call genocide, the extermination of European Jews. And, and if you have forgotten this, I want you to remember the staggering number. Six million Jews were exterminated in concentration camps. Six million Jews. That's six, more than five times the size of the Nashville, greater Nashville area. It's a staggering number. One man's decision. Now, we, we know that there was a cultural problem here too, but we know that one man's decision set off a motion that the final solution, and though they were already gathered in concentration camps and ghettos, uh, this accelerated the evil. One man's decision. You may not know this, and I don't want to insult your intelligence, but I, I'm a teacher too, so I'd like to give the most basic, basic truths because I know in my life, sometimes I overlook basic truths because people move past me. So in case you didn't know this, the nation of Israel uh, ended in A.D. 70, and it wasn't all the way until 1948 that the nation of Israel existed again. And they existed again because Jews were then and still are scattered throughout the world. Scattered throughout the world. 
And the Holocaust meant they weren't protected. It wasn't the first time Jews had been exterminated. And there's quite a history of their persecution. But it was a culmination of educated people with PhDs at the highest level of German society. German society is where theological truth had sprung from. Modern theological truth, modern reason. And yet within that culture, unchecked, unchecked, evil took residence and the Holocaust occurred. So the world, when it fully accepted the Holocaust, said, this can never happen again. This can never happen again. The Jews need a homeland. The Jews need their own government. The Jews need their own army. And this was quite controversial in England and in America. But one man, and God used one man, and you're going to be surprised who it is, President Harry Truman. President Harry Truman made a decision that he would recognize Israel as a country in the year 1948. And when Truman recognized Israel, then the United Nations recognized Israel. And it, it made the prophecy come true. It's a question, can a nation be formed in one day? Well, it was in 1948 when the United Nations recognized Israel, a place for Jews, but not exclusive to Jews. There are, there are Muslim citizens of Israel there are Muslims who are part of the Israeli government. So it's not exclusively, or Arabs for sure, it's not exclusively for Jewish people. Christians are citizens of Israel. But the point I want to make here is Hitler, one decision, the final solution. Truman, one decision under great um, political pressure. He made one decision that had changed American foreign policy up until last, and, and it has continued. You see it continued with our leadership today who is standing with Israel. And so this is the power of one decision. This is the power of, in leadership, making one decision. Now, I take this back to what the scripture was saying. Let's go, let's go back to verse 21. For since death came through a man, that's Adam. And Adam, his choice brought sin into the world. The resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. This is why the resurrection is everything, because the resurrection reverses the curse of sin. The resurrection reverses the consequence of original sin. The resurrection changes what that media person I mentioned earlier called depravity. He said, depravity, it's not a fun word. We don't, like to, we don't like to think, well, we're depraved until we see the worst of humanity. And we're like, okay, we, we need redemption. We need holiness. We need the imputation of righteousness that comes through Christ. We need transformation. We know this is that by ourselves, in ourselves, we're never moral enough, wise enough, kind enough, loving enough. We could be, we can get so far, but only so far. We have to have the transformational power of Jesus Christ. Here's the third point. Resurrection brings change. And this was a part that the Corinthian church struggled with. And maybe you've struggled. You know, the question is like, how's it going to happen? And what's going to happen to me? And all of the questions we have about our bodies, what will it be like? Will I look the same? Will I be at my optimal age? Will I be at my optimal weight? Will I be able to, will, will I be able to change my hair color? You know, what, 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 all of these questions. And, and, you know, how's it going to happen? Well, let's go to verse 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? That's, that, that's a question I get asked when I talk about the subject. What kind of body will they have when they come? Right? These are natural questions. You fool. What you sow does not come to life until it dies. He's talking to farming people. You put a seed, and until you bury the seed, you're not going to know what comes out of the ground. This is, this is an incredible, incredible lesson from nature. And for what you sow, you're not sowing the body that will be, but only a seed, perhaps of wheat 
or another grain. So think about this. He's saying this. If, if you put a seed in the ground, if you put, if you put a, um, an oak seed, what's an oak seed called? An ache, thank you. That wasn't in the nose. That's the most congregation participation I've had in a long time. time. If you put, if you put, and, and there's so much disdain on it, like an acorn, like, come on, come on, dude. Come on, Dr. Allison, it's an acorn. So you put an acorn in the ground and, and this is what it is. You, you get, you get an oak tree, right? So, so what you put in the ground is going to come out different. This is the point here. What you sow, you, you are not sowing the body that will be, verse 37, but only a seed, perhaps of wheat or grain. But God gives a body as he wants. Well, praise God for that, right? God gives it a body as he wants. We're under his sovereign hand to each of the seeds, his own body. Not all flesh is the same flesh. There's one flesh for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. We know this. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is different from that of earthly ones. There is a splendor of the sun, another of the moon, another of the stars. In fact, one star differs, another star in splendor. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. Now, I love this. This is going to preach here. I, I need my organ here. Sown in corruption, raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown in natural body, raised a spiritual body. It, hey, that's good preaching right there, right? <laughs> so this idea is it goes down one way and it comes up another. So we can trust that God is going to give us new spiritual bodies. And we're going to like them. We're going to like them. Guys, this gives us great hope for our future. And it's why we honor the body in this life and we honor the body in death. God's going to raise up a spiritual body in the resurrection. The body is essential. We don't believe in Greek dualism, that only the spirit is good and the body is bad. Sometimes the interpretation of Romans about flesh and spirit, it, it makes us think that the physical body is bad, but this now is talking about behavior. It's not talking about the value of matter. Matter makes a difference. That's why we eat bread and drink the cup because physical matter gives a spiritual connection. Here's a couple of mistakes that we make in the year 2023. In this life, guys, we have a problem with worshiping the body. We have a problem with lust. That, that's just a fact. If you really think about lust, if you get past the emotions of it, or the, even the physical reaction to it, or the mental reaction. It's just, it's, a, it's a body. It's, a, it's another body. It's another body. And we're not called to lust after that body. And so that's something to remember. That's something, we idolize the body. That, that's something, this whole, this whole um, beyond just healthy practices, which are good. The sculpting the body to elicit lust out of other people, uh, to make us feel like we're not mortal, to make us feel like we're, you know, we're ahead of the curve for our age because we're so, our physical body so good. This is a mistake. The apostle James warns us that we judge by outward appearance. This is a mistake with the physical body. That, like some people come into this service and, and we judge them. I know some people won't listen to my sermons because they judge the way I look. And, and that's just part of sinfulness. That's just part of the sinfulness. Whatever reason, whatever reason, they'll make a judgment. I don't like that guy. I don't want to hear him for whatever reason. But then that's the first mistake is worshiping the body. But here's the second mistake that I want, I want the Holy Spirit to speak to you today. We despise the body. And I want you to hear this. I'm not speaking as a counselor. We have wonderful professional counselors in this room watching this, and I believe in professional counseling. So now I'm speaking just pastorally, okay? So I know there's complications to this, from, but from a pastoral standpoint, self-harm is not God's will. It is, it is damaging his temple. So we should not, we should not participate in self-harm of our body. It, it, it is a it is an outflow. It's an outflow of deception. It's an outflow of the enemy's plan for our life. 
a, a distorted self-image where we are always looking at ourselves and degrading ourselves. Some of us despise our bodies and that's not God's will. Some of us despise our appearance and we are in the trap of the enemy. We need to, we need to stop comparing our bodies to someone else's bodies, whether it be our, you know, our hair, our eyes, our figure, whether it be a scar that we don't like, whether it be a, a gray in our beard that we don't want, you know, whatever it is, we, we, we despise them. That's not God's will. And then, of course, unhealthy practices. All of us, all of us can make a decision to be more healthy. And, and that's God's will. Not to worship the body, but to have more, more healthy practice. Our resurrected bodies will be different. Just as a seed you put in the ground, the harvest looks different. But God will grow. God will give us the body he wants us to have. We have a little bit of insight in Christ after his resurrection. After Christ's resurrection, he had a physicalness about him. Um, he, was able to, he was able to eat. He cooked and distributed food. People touched him in his resurrection body. But yet, he was able to vanish immediately. He was able to go through locked doors without physical restrictions. He was able to appear suddenly. That may give us some insight into the type of bodies we will have in the future. But it's not really important because God is the one who will choose. And he has a good body for us in the future. And because of that, we honor our body in the now. We honor our body in the present. We, we don't worship our body or anyone else's body, but we value our body and we do not participate in self-harm. And we move towards health that doesn't idolize us. Death is so hard. You know, and I, I uh, one of the privileges of being a pastor is I'm around death a lot. And I know some of you in the medical field, you're around death a lot. And it's just always difficult and it's always hard. And even some of the greatest saints, it can feel like a tough transition. But through Jesus, and because of the resurrection, think about this, because of the resurrection that's coming, death is not final. Frederick, Frederick Beatner, a Christian writer of the 20th century, said, resurrection means the worst thing is never the last thing. Resurrection means the worst thing is never the last thing. And here's my last point today, point four. Resurrection swallows death. The resurrection that has happened and the resurrection is coming. I, I want to say this. If you're in this room, if you're watching online, have you ever been scared that you're not going to make it to heaven? Listen, I want you to hear this truth today. God who loves you wants you in heaven. He wants you in heaven. He doesn't want you to miss it. He wants you to make it. And there was this concern with the Corinth church, the church in Corinth. The concern was that if Jesus comes and I'm not dead, am I going to miss it? I mean, that's logical, right? Like you, you would think, hey, if Jesus comes again and I'm dead, am I going to miss it? What happens if we're alive and Jesus returns? Am I saying Jesus is about to return? I have no idea. I really don't. I don't think, I don't think uh, even, even the consequences of this week, to me, from my perspective of theology, doesn't mean he's coming back this week or next week. I think Jesus could come back today, and all Christians should live that way. Or I think it's plausible it'll be another 2,000 years. And, and that's, that's just my interpretation of Scripture. But I do know this, is that when he comes... If you're not dead physically, that you're not going to miss it. Because here's the question, verse 51. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep. We will not all die. But we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. And the dead will be raised incorruptible. That's the resurrection that's coming. And then look, we, who are, we will be changed. For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorrupt, incorruptibility. 
And this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. When this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus swallows up death. Jesus swallows up Hades. Jesus swallows up the grave. We don't have to fear because those who have gone before us who who are no longer physically with us, they're going to be resurrected with new bodies. And those of us who are still here, we're going to be changed. It's going to happen in an instant. It's going to happen in a moment. That which is corruptible, our physical ailments, our habits we can't break, our spiritual uh, questions, we will be changed. And in a moment, all of those things that are corruptible will become incorruptible. This is the promise that the Lord gives us. My brothers and sisters, there is a resurrection coming. Paul assured the Corinthians, the believers there, that they weren't going to miss it. And by the word of the Lord, I tell you today, you're not going to miss it. You've got a better body coming. It's not going to be corruptible. It's not going to let you down. It's not going to fail you. It's not going to house disease. It's not going to even house sin. It's incorruptible. Not because you're good, not because you're moral, not because you're enlightened, not because you've reached a new level. It's because the one who is in you is greater than the one that's in the world. Jesus is transforming you by his power and by his righteousness and by by who he is. I want to invite Josh to join me up here and Pastor Jacob, you can join me too. Here is the gospel of Jesus. Jesus took the sin of the world upon himself. Jesus conquered death, Hades, and the grave through his resurrection. And all who believe in Jesus has eternal life. Listen to me. Listen to me. Because Jesus was resurrected, you will be resurrected. Your future will keep getting better and better and better. Resurrection is coming. Thanks be to God. So maybe it is most fitting for me to say this to you. He is risen. Amen. Amen. I love that Pastor Aaron was sharing the story. Uh, the, the first moments that the disciples, again, were afraid, anxious, and a run. That Jesus just pops up in the room that they were in. What's important about this story is that, yes, it is a resurrected body. But there was this guy named Thomas who said, if I don't come and touch him, I'm not going to believe. But Thomas came saw this Jesus and Jesus said come and look at my scar come and see now if you did not know this only moments days earlier Jesus was pierced and what came out of that scar was water and blood the church would recognize this as a symbolism of the sacraments both baptism and communion So that when Thomas came up to this resurrected body Jesus, he was coming to the God that says, yes, come to me. Come to me. So that every time that we celebrate baptisms and every time that we celebrate through communion, we receive that very same message. Come to me. Come alive, church. Come alive. You got scars? Come and see mine. Come to this table and hear the whisper of a God who says, come alive. And what I love about this story is that when he introduces Thomas and Thomas comes to him and he shows his scars, it's an invitation to the new life that Jesus was introducing through his resurrection. So every time we come to the table, We are a part of a society of resurrection. A society where all people who come to this table hear the whisper, I want you. Come alive. 
So if you are a communion server, can you go ahead and make your place this morning? We'll be taking communion uh, through what we call intinction. We dip the bread into the cup. I want to encourage you in this, that as you come up to the table, would you be still enough to hear his voice as the body is broken and as you dip that body into the cup? Would you be still enough to hear the whisper, I want you, come alive. Will you stand with me as we pray this congregational prayer together? Let's pray this prayer together. Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, set up your kingdom in our midst. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Holy Spirit, breath of the living God, renew me and all of the world. The table is open. We have prayer partners up at the front. Come, you are wanted. Jesus Christ, 
Let me give our benediction today. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his countenance towards you and give you peace. I love you. Jesus loves you. Thank you for being at church today. I hope you have a great week in him. God bless you.